Hello, good morning. Welcome back to my live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz. Today is June 21st, 2018, and I've got Echo. There we go. Let me get rid of that. Um, I'm wearing my Xbox hat today because I think we're going to have a little bit of fun on stream. I've got, I've got a guest joining me today. I'm so excited to be able to bring on. Let me bring her on over here. It is Rachel Lapel. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Jeff. What's happening? Oh, my gosh. I've been doing some SignalR work, and I wanted to bring on an expert. Why don't you introduce yourself? Well, uh, first of all, before I even start, there's maybe a 10-second delay between what you say and then a tiny echo of what you said <laughs> coming across the wire. I just <laughs> muted that. It should be gone. Is it gone? It's supposed to be gone. Unless it's coming through on your side, because uh, you have if you see. if you have the Twitch window up. Oh, I have the Twitch window up. I think it's coming through on my side. What do I do about this? Just mute the window over there. Oh. There's a. Mute oh, that's better. Like, okay. Hey. All right. No, that's better now. Okay, I don't have to hear myself after I hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm Rachel LaBelle, and uh, I do a lot of work with ASP.NET and uh, recently with SignalR. Uh, so far, I'm on the docs team, so I've been doing up all the content for SignalR, and uh, I give a lot of talks about that topic and ASP.NET Core and ASP.NET. And all things web, a little bit of Azure. All things web, right? Yeah. That's, that's what makes things go. Um, my gosh, at least with us, because we're both very ASP.NET focused. And gosh, it feels like we met back in at a Philly code camp, what, 2007, something around that area. Yeah, way back. I was, I was just an annoying person saying, hey, I need help learning this. And here's Rachel as an MVP. Yeah, go away. I don't, That's any I, different than what I do today. <laughs> I know. Gosh. All right. So, the, so a couple folks, is signal our shenanigans? Absolutely, Janesco. I see that comment over there. Um, the first question that I wanted to make sure that we got clear for folks is what is SignalR? Now, is there some place in the docs we should go to start talking about SignalR? Yeah, absolutely. So if you haven't done it before, uh, you just want to head right over to SignalR Core and start with the new stuff, uh, unless you have a particular reason to go with the older version. If it's all nice and new and shiny, probably not. Uh, so what SignalR is, is a set of libraries uh, that are small and focused, and it's focused on building real-time web applications as well as client applications. Uh, cross-platform, actually. And this way, you can simulate a bit of how the LAN operates as opposed to the internet model of things. Now, what do you mean by that? Simulate the way the LAN operates versus the yeah. internet model? So if you think about it, when you're at work and you're wired into your work network, or even nowadays on wireless at work, mm -hmm, generally mm -hmm. you're connected to your local area network, and the speeds are pretty zippy. Right. You generally don't have a whole lot of latency. Yeah, there will be the crappy app here or there that really hugs up everything. But in general, well-written software is going to perform well. You just get that speed benefit. And everything is instant, instant, instant. Oh, my gosh, yeah. You yeah. write dedicated 100 MIPS right to the server because it's in your own network, in a data center, maybe on-premises. Absolutely. Right. And the whole rest of the web is just not that. Uh, so the whole HTTP programming model evolved around that limitation of the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's where we make our request. The server generates a response, sends the response back to the browser, and then there's a complete disconnection. Uh, the server does not know about the client. The client does not know about the server. They just go about their merry ways. But there, uh, it's, it's a stateless connection at that point. Very much a stateless connection. And we're not trying to bring state into it, but what we're trying to do is uh, just create a pipeline so that you can send data back and forth two ways instead of just request response. We could do a request and then have multiple responses if we want. Yeah. Um, and it can happen in 
you know, immediacy in real time instead of having to wait for a complete round trip to happen. Right. When I'm on that local network, if I'm doing just server, client server programming for my server to be able to push a message to those clients, that's really cool. That's easy for me to configure. I see a bunch of folks hosting us. Thanks so much. Um, and and as a as a server person, right, as somebody who likes to write server software, I love being able to push down into my clients and say, hey, here's new data for you. Here's something that you need to do, but that doesn't work with the web. Correct. Uh, yeah, you can't just go and push out updates to random clients on the web. Uh, so that's where SignalR comes in. Once we create a handshake, then SignalR server-side components, which are called hubs, can then do things like push notifications or push data out to the clients. Uh, so you could do it in just regular chunks of data, but you can also even stream data down to the client and everything. Mm. So it's really, really nice uh, mimicry of the, you know, like a nice fat client on a local area network if you oh, need yeah. to. So you get that real-time data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's a question in the chat room. How does stuff like router protocol affect your programming? I don't know. I don't know things about router protocol. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, just doing the regular hubs API in SignalR, not, there's no effect. You don't really need to know about it. Right. You're, we're continuing to use port 80. We're using HTTP. We're using WebSockets. We shouldn't be running into issues with router protocol. Yeah, yeah, right. It's yeah, it's all like high level programming. Now you can go and write against WebSockets and ASP.NET Core, but mm -hmm. uh, the point of SignalR is so that you don't have to do that. Uh, so they just have a hubs model. So all of that stuff is taken care of for you. Right, that abstraction over right. whether it's whether it's WebSockets, it's long polling like we used right. to do back in the early two thousands. Um, the, right, the forever frame approach where you have an iframe out there that just never <laughs> resp finishes responding, right. which, uh, which I always thought was kind of weird, but it was a way to work <laughs> around it. Right. Um, but right, it, it's that abstraction, and SignalR will just figure out what's the best way to connect and give you that live interaction. Exactly. That's the whole point of it. So it you can specify the transport in SignalR core, uh, but in general, it's going to try to go after WebSockets. If it can't, then it's going to you know pick something else. Um, Follow-up question is, do things like firewalls make troubleshooting harder? Generally, no. No. The right. minute you say no about something like that, though, just the fact Somebody's going to find there, a problem. Somebody's going to find a problem. Yeah. Like but that. if the firewall is letting port 80 through, right. you're in. Uh, you know? That's true. However, uh, like I remember having some issues with SQL and things. So if you start plugging into a database in the back end, I could see some issues or something. But they should be long taken care of as well, just with some of the modern frameworks and data access. Uh, methods that we have unrelated to SignalR. Mm, okay. Now, SignalR Core, right? SignalR is now part of ASP.NET Core. Yeah. What's the difference between SignalR with ASP Core and the, the previous versions of SignalR we saw shipped with .NET Framework? Yeah, so this is a very common question or stumbling block for a lot of folks. Um, so there was a small gap in when... SignalR Core was supposed to ship as opposed to the rest of .NET Core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, in the meantime, there was some confusion. Right? In general, when we have releases, this tends to happen. Oh, yeah. Uh, but SignalR, the classic version of it, or SignalR for .NET, uh, the .NET framework, they both have the same goals in mind and generally just do the same things. Conceptually, they're the same. And the team tried to make it so that programmatically they can be as close as possible, uh, but they did gut some things and do some major restructuring. Uh, so trying to balance those two components, having to do the major restructuring for some of the new goals, uh, but trying to keep those old ones in mind. Uh, so what happens is in older SignalR, you would have a hard dependency on jQuery on the client. Uh, whether or not you were using jQuery elsewhere in your mm -hmm. in your code and it made sense at the time because jQuery was pretty much going in every project oh gosh yes 
Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but then jQuery kind of fell out of favor after a while, after people realized, like, look, it just does a bunch of get document by IDs and stuff like that. Right? Wait, a JavaScript <laughs> library fell out of favor? Do Imagine. tell. How does I that know, happen? Right? <laughs> Imagine. I yeah. don't know. Okay. So, uh, peasants revolt, and then here, you now we're taking <laughs> <laughs> or taking uh, jQuery out. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. can still use jQuery or any JavaScript library because the JavaScript library it has is just that. It's just JavaScript. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing that um, that's a big thing noticeable. Right? So you don't need jQuery, but you can have it. Um, some certain things like auto reconnects are gone. So where it would try to reconnect for you, now you have to do it. And some of the scaling and uh, problems with connections that were just too much to have in the source code uh, is why some of that got removed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that, um, yep. those kind of things. Um, the client libraries where it's changed the most. Um, it all yeah. does the same thing. You can create a method in, say, JavaScript or in .NET, and the server can actually call directly into that block of code. Uh, however, the syntax has changed. Mm -hmm. So instead of using this little dollar dot syntax that you would use, similar to a jQuery syntax in the older versions, uh, now you just do a take. You grab a connection object and you build it, and then after you build it, you take that connection object and do a connection dot on connection dot start, and issue some of the methods right off of there, and then you can define uh, where those locations are for the hub to call. Why don't we start taking a look at some code, yep. and then we can talk about the work that we wanted to do here together. But first, there was a question in the chat room that I want to make sure we get to. Here we go. They're asking about when we want to scale this up, when we want to get past one server. Previously, we used to use as a backplane, where we had the concept of a backplane to have multiple servers yep. communicate with each other. And we would recommend using Redis or SQL Server to backplane and get those servers communicating with each other. But now we have this SignalR service. Yep. So the SignalR service is a whole separate thing. Uh, what it does is there's some limitations when you push a SignalR app to an Azure app service specifically. And I think it's like 1,200 or 1,000 uh, simultaneous connections. So you can have a scaling issue, not necessarily SignalR, but once you deploy it to an app service mm -hmm. as a web app. So it's on that side. Some, uh, so, some hosting service, not just Azure, but you know AWS, Google, your own hosting internally. There's, yeah. a, there's a maximum number of folks that you can have connected to the one web server. Yeah, and that stuff will also depend on whatever that service or ISP says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, however they have that configured. Uh, so Azure, the SignalR service on Azure is supposed to help with scaling that way so that you can just use one of those services and then it could take care of all the scaling stuff in the background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Martin, thank you for the follow there as we Steve makes his first appearance of the day. Um, Synaptic Code says, so is SignalR a framework that takes advantage of other existing protocols, WebSockets, HTTP polling, rather than its own unique protocol? Uh, that's exactly what yeah. SignalR is. So it just uses WebSockets if it can. If not, it falls down to long polling or server sent events. Uh, it used to also check forever frame um, because of IE, IE8. Mm -hmm. And now the world does not care about IE8. <sighs> Rightly so. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, so long polling is gone. So, yay. <laughs> no more. Yes. Thank you, IE8, for leaving us. So, and having that abstraction means that you don't, you don't, as the as the app programmer, don't need to write. Well, if I have this, then do this. Well, if I have that, then do this. It just figures it out and negotiates for you. Right, uh, so that's called transport negotiation, and it's all in the source code. So you could look at the current and the previous release source code for that, and it is. It's just lengthy, drawn-out, pain-in-the-butt code that, you and know, I mean, if you code. work at Microsoft, that's the kind of code you're producing. You're producing code so other people can solve business problems, right? But if you're 
not at Microsoft. You want to actually solve your business problems. Um, so Get doing a, that is not solving a business problem, figuring out if you need web sockets or long polling. So uh, another good reason for having something like SignalR for this this kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. And C17 says, you'd like to think that, but I have clients still using very old IE browsers. Yes, mm -hmm. feels bad, man. <laughs> like it says. I'm so sorry. Yes, well, support is still out. There is still the older version does work, and it is still supported. So yeah. that does have forever frame. So here's the source code for, for SignalR if you want to check it out, github.com slash ASP.NET slash SignalR. <clears throat> and we're actually already using a little bit of SignalR here on the stream between both the GitHub ticker that you see up at the top, our scoreboard showing all the folks that have contributed to some of our projects on stream, and below me here on my nameplate, the follower count and the current number of viewers there on Twitch, they're both being loaded up and maintained with a SignalR service that's pushing that data into, into what you're seeing here on video. Now, I understand we also moved the JavaScript client, and, and I need to make sure that I make, that it's clear that the JavaScript client, because there's other clients for SignalR, not yeah. just websites, but the JavaScript client now is on NPM. Yeah, so this is another source of confusion for a lot of folks. In the older version, you would make an ASP.NET project, and then you would add in the SignalR libraries, which would add in both the server and the client packages. Mm -hmm. It would just throw them all in for you. Uh, and then there was a separate .NET client. So, um, but it, that... Now it's a little different. Okay. So now in ASP.NET Core, when you do file new project, SignalR is built into that template already. So you don't need a package for the server side. And if you go to your new gets and then you like, drill into it um, in your server explorer or project explorer rather solution explorer mm -hmm. then you will see like the signal r core signal r just plain signal r a couple different new get packages now for that client like you said you have to go to npm just to get the javascript client and that will bring down both the usable client in javascript as well as some of the typescript source code so that means, <clears throat> unlike previous versions of, <clears throat> of SignalR, where we were tightly coupled to ASP.NET, because we're now shipping that JavaScript client in NPM, you don't have to be an ASP.NET application in order to couple and use and, and connect to in a SignalR service. Well, correct. I mean, you technically didn't before if you could just get the JavaScript files, which yeah. meant going in the studio at some point and getting that package. but Or um, downloading the NuGet and decompressing right, it and picking it out of there. Doing something like that, right. right. Um, so it's, it's always been that JavaScript client for the cross-compatibility, right? Because everything supports JavaScript. Everything, uh, yes. Even uh, but PHP. There's also, yeah. <laughs> there's also a uh, .NET client, so that works with anything .NET, like WPF, Windows mm. Forms, a console apps, Xamarin apps, so anything that works with .NET Framework uh, or .NET Core, you're good uh, for the .NET client. And then later on, they're talking about a Java client and some other stuff as well. Yeah, but it, it, it's interesting you touched on Xamarin apps, right? Think about it. It's you all could, the rage now. It, pff, all the cool kids are building them. That means you could build an iPhone or an Android app that has yeah. that live push coming from a server. Yep. Which makes perfect sense if you want to have some sort of live interaction with your application. You want to do not just live chat. You want to have folks get live updates because something time critical is happening. Yep. So uh, SNB asks, any plans for the JavaScript library to be available via the upco upcoming Libman? Uh, so I, d I don't know if you've seen this, Rachel, but there's a... a a plugin coming to Visual Studio called Libman that allows you to manage your JavaScript libraries a little bit easier than using NPM. NPM. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that yet. Uh, so, so here's... Uh, they, last I heard, the team was talking about they were bugging the VS team for more pointy-clicky stuff on NPM integration, but 
Uh, so you know how this industry is, like the winds blow the other way tomorrow. So So what's so great about Libman, and I let me check if I have it actually installed here. If I right click, there's my bundler in Minifier. Uh, manage client side library. So check this out. This is this is the JSON file that defines the libraries that you're including and using here. Um, I can actually start adding libraries here and say, uh, what's the provider? And have it come right off of CDN.js. Oh, nice. It doesn't replace Bower, but I can have it come from CDN.js, or the other option here is also file system. So I can say, well, pull the files, right? And I can specify the collection of files to pull, um, right? I can go against, I can go against node modules, right? Is it, oh, that's nice. Right? Yeah. And it'll copy those files in for me. And I'm not getting my autocomplete here. They're still working on how you're going to interact with this file. Um, but if I bring up, if I bring up that folder, um, stream, oh, fritz.stream tools. Remember the name of the project, Jeff. Uh, ta -ta. I, I like that confetti when you type. I know, right? I turned on power mode again. <laughs> right? We love power mode. There's node modules. So I can actually reach down directly into these files and let NPM bring up the data, the content that it needs, and then use libman to move it into the location that I want. So that's one way that you can interact with this. But having it come off of CDN.js yeah. is... Um, well, this is certainly the kind of tool that gets picked up and wrapped into Visual Studio mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. frequently. So, um, If I... Right, let's see if it finds... There's SignalRJS. I don't know if that's the right one. No, I think that's the old one. Um, is it... Am I going to find it under at ASP.NET? Nope, it's not going to find it. But you can... Mm. You can use this to bring it in from those two providers, and they're adding more providers. NPM is one of the providers they want to add to Libman. But the idea is Libman is going to help you cross that boundary of you downloaded some, some libraries. They're somewhere on disk. Copy them into my project at a specific location, yep. which then gets confusing with the bundler minifier because we then have this bundle config that says, well, go grab this file from this location, uh, output this file that's a combination of these things that we want to minify. So a bunch of different tools that you can use to move things around. Of course, you, if you want, you can write, you can write NPM scripts that'll go and do all that for you. Gulp and Grunt are out there. My gosh, Rachel, we went through the whole Grunt and then Gulp changeover yeah. with ASP.NET Core. And like you were saying, we were chasing the tools, which feels weird now in, in hindsight. Yeah. Um, Lucky number seven asks, uh, I read that full framework clients can't connect to core standard servers. I know that I got the standard client put into Unity and connected to a core server in SignalR. However, full framework didn't connect. Have you seen anything with connected between uh, different versions? You cannot connect between core and non-core versions of SignalR. So that's correct. You can't. So as a client, you can only connect to one or the other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You either core to core or .NET to .NET. Okay. So that feels like something where where the I I can understand the full framework client doesn't know how to connect to core yet. Right. It feels like that's right. something that we should update. And it would be really nice to be able to have those older right, things that are embedded in Windows Forms, WPF, be able to connect to a core server. Uh, so you can actually do a WinForms, and there's the ASP.NET Core client. Okay. Um, let me remember if... Uh... Oh, I believe it's the .NET client doc has a sample with this. Uh, just a WinForms project with the core, the ASP.NET Core client. If I bring up um, the docs, would we be able to find it real quick? Should be able to. If only we knew somebody who on the docs wrote team. the docs. 
FGI, I don't know. Who would that be? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So would it be in this section, or do we do a search? What do you think? Yeah, no, no, I keep going down. It's under Signalar. So I'm in Create Real-Time Signalar app. Yeah, no, you're under Tutorials. So you need to go uh, down on here your, to this your one? left. Yeah, no, keep going. Like way off in a whole different node section. Yeah, yeah, I changed sections. .NET yeah. Client. On the left? Yeah. No, not there. Not this one? No. Oh, oh. there you go. There you go. So .NET Client there. Okay. Oh, maybe it wasn't refreshing on the screen fast enough. Um, so connect to a hub. So we're, you're doing the same thing that we do in JavaScript. Connect to a yep. hub, build yep. the connection, and then you wire up callback methods. Yep, it's almost identical, except the package comes from an actual NuGet package, and the syntax is a tiny bit. Uh, actually, it's not even that different. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, and it, it does look very similar to what what we've yep. already done here on stream in um, in JavaScript. Um, Bilal has a question. Can you brief us on how SignalR connects to the ASP.NET Core pipeline? Well, it's basically just starts off with an HTTP request. Uh, once it connects, it then decides, well, I'm just going to use, like I'm going to do a handshake, create a pipeline. Um, so it's not like there's a pipeline unless you mean middleware uh, but there's not really a pipeline it actually creates like a pipeline um, between the server and the client and yeah. then it just sends the messages through that pipeline so um is that d costia welcome thank you for the follow uh and our friend fierce kittens is here good morning it always feels weird saying good morning to somebody named fierce kittens but hey um, all right, let's close that. I need to make sure my Skype is marked as do not disturb. Yes, it's just, all right, there we go. Um, yes, middleware pipeline. Um, yeah, so if it's just middleware that we're talking about, sometimes people say pipeline for middleware, and there's the pipeline for signal R too. Um, so middleware, you do have to register it with middleware. So in the startup, you'll see a use signal R and a map signal R. Yep. Yeah. You that so, here so that's needed to use it in core. So I have it here inside of my configure method, use signal R, right? And you want it before the final use MVC that terminates at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're mapping the various hubs that you yep. should be connecting, including one that might be so elegantly named here. It's not zooming anymore for me. Oh, no. So, yeah. But thanks for the naming there, Rachel. <laughs> it's internet democracy at its finest. So the story... make it hub face. The story goes, I was asking... <laughs> I, I was asking on Twitter, I, I need to create another hub another signal R hub so that we can load the data for the the ticker that we see up at the top. And David Fowler, one of the architects for signal R said, Oh, you don't need a you only need one hub really in your project and you can just route everything through that one hub and everybody just connect to it and manage your connections independently. And for the purposes of giving a demo and showing it separately, I thought it would be nice to have it in a separate one. I said, well, what should I name this this separate one? And of course, here in the corner, GitHubby McGitHub face was born. <laughs> and that comes about from, uh, I think it was last year. Yeah. There was a research project in which they built this new shiny research vessel, a boat, mm -hmm. ship, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and they decided to allow the internet to vote on what it should be called. And the internet called this boat, Boaty McBoatface. And I, it, it wasn't an Irish boat, was it? I think it was uh, from the UK. I don't know okay. if it was Irish specifically um, from over on that side of the pond, but over somewhere in the Isles, yeah. I believe it came from. Uh, yeah. But it ended up with Boaty McBoatface boat face and then somebody did this with a racehorse so then people jumped on it and called it horsey mchorse face <laughs> that one is hysterical 
Horsey McHorse <laughs> face. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm so sorry. now no. anytime there's a chance to name something, it has to be named with this pattern because it's just too silly. It's it is. Funny. Oh my gosh. And then of course the JavaScript library that goes with it is the Mick GitHub bub. Right. Okay. <laughs> we've had our face. we've had our fun. Um so it goes with the confetti typing. Absolutely. We're gonna have Lots of fun with confetti typing. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, but I missed to see what they use for JavaScript and CSS bundling and minification. It's not Bower, Grunt, or Gulp, is it? Um, so there's a, right there's this tool that comes with with Visual Studio that comes with ASP.NET now called the Bundler Minifier, and you end up with a little JSON file that has a command in here that says minify, and if you specify more than one input file it'll bundle those all together for you. So that's what we're using, is that WinRec. Let me know how to pronounce your, your, your handle there. So that's what we use now for these, these files, only because of the, the significant transition and the, tra and the tra cost to change over from Grunt to Gulp, Bower to NPM. It, it doesn't stay still long enough for anybody to adjust and, and really consume and build tools around it. So, you know, we'll take what we've learned that's the best of breed from those and kind of grow it and make it something that, that Microsoft can support. So I think that kind of makes sense. For, I mean, somebody here said that they've got clients that already have, inter that still have Internet Explorer from years ago. All right, well, we need to support things longer term than just six months or three months or however long the JavaScript community wants to support it. And that's okay. What? <laughs> Some groups move at different speed than others. Crazy talk. I know, right? Everybody should move like lightning fast. Everybody change it, over. You know, back in my day, we didn't Wait have fun and minification. We had to go in there and delete the white space all by ourselves. <gasps> Both ways uphill in the snow. <laughs> back in my day back when we were writing code <sighs> I've heard people say what does a pack of milk have in common with JavaScript frameworks both are due by the end of the week both are going to yep. expire by the end of the week more right. like it yeah. uh, government's updating technology at the speed of government yeah Hugo you're right so um, and banks as well how many mainframes with COBOL are hanging out there still from the 70s. Oh, yeah. So, um, all right. Today I wanted to talk to you about optimizing some of the ways that I'm interacting with that ticker up at the top. So um, so we've talked about what SignalR is, how it, how it interacts with things. Um, <laughs> biz talk. Biz talk. Hugo. <laughs> This ticker that I have at the top right now, all that I'm doing is when I when I hear that there's been an update on on my GitHub repository, I you send call it. BizTalk. I, I call BizTalk, <laughs> and it sends a notification to a guy who sends a fax that gets picked up. It's very Rube Gold Rube Goldbergian, and it's amazing how many people don't know what Rube Goldberg is. Considering a lot of people write code like that, they really should ought to know it. Yes. Yeah. Right? And honestly, when I when I think about uh, serverless architecture and people writing functions or lambdas out in the cloud, right? They write, you know, oh, we're going to see that there's an update on, on this piece of blob storage or this data record. And we're going to trigger this function that sends messages over here into a queue that gets picked up and sends a transmission and eventually we update a client and we publish this it's like holy crow aren't you the same people that were opposed to database triggers <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true i'm just saying <laughs> i'm not saying but i'm just saying <laughs> database triggers <laughs> um i i need to find better sound effects um so what i'm doing here when I when when I see that there's been an update to a GitHub repository, um, inside of here I send a a GitHub updated message and raise this on updated method, 
that occurs inside of that scroll use user interface that you see up there. And this is the source code for it. Um, and it really, all it is is, right, here's top for the week, top for the month, top all time. The very same things you see up there. And we're just formatting and outputting those values. Here is the, the JavaScript that actually gets raised, right, at new Mick GitHub bub, which I, I feel like it's a, uh, makes me hungry for a McRib. Um, <laughs> but I listen for the on updated, right? I set up this function, this anonymous function. Well, I guess it's not anonymous, named function. Um, I destroy the, I, I'm using a jQuery marquee because nobody likes the marquee tag, so we'll just rewrite our own. Um, so I destroy the marquee effect, I update it to say update incoming, and then I reload. I'm literally reloading the contents of the marquee tag from the server and then re-enabling it after it's done loading the data. The problem that I'm having, Rachel, is I can't reload right away. I almost need to build a, a delay in here where um, if, if I load as soon as there's an update, GitHub hasn't recalculated the statistics yet. So I've been merging changes from some of our friends that we see here in the chat room. Some of the, you know, they're out there, they're writing some code for us, they're helping us out. But uh, as soon as I commit those changes and merge it, the scoreboard updates and we don't get their change appearing, which feels bad, right? I wanna make sure that it shows, you know, hey, we've got a contribution from Parathon, from, I'm looking, from Genescu, from some of our friends out here. And I need to kind of build this delay in here. And then instead of forcing this reload, you were saying there's a way to stream the data in. Would it make sense to stream the data to refill just that part of, of the ticker? Actually, this yeah, is if when you we can, think. why not stream like little bits into the ticker instead of doing the whole thing? Instead of clobbering it. Right, <laughs> clobbering, that's a good word. We, we like to clobber. Yep. DB triggers are fun to debug with a crying face. Yes. <laughs> with a crying face. Yes. That's the only way to debug them. Right. <laughs> but, and, and we're very Rube Goldbergian in this setup, right? We're, we get the commit in, in GitHub. We, we see, the, see that change, and we're going to do this update of the, uh, of the ticker. So... So, it, well, first off, I want to make sure that folks understand we're connected with LiveShare. You can see Rachel's initials up here in the top right corner. So she can actually see my Visual Studio and make changes in here and make my life difficult or actually help out. It's her choice. Um, <laughs> because when you share this, it becomes read-write. Yeah, see, there she is now. <laughs> and you can see the little tape flag where she is navigating and around the no, screen. no, I'm in your code. <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> Be very afraid. Um, but what's nice about this, I can have upwards to five people connected in with LiveShare, and it doesn't just have to be Visual Studio. Folks ask, can I do this with Visual Studio Code? Yes, and it doesn't have to be .NET. It can be any, any language that uh, Visual Studio Code supports. LiveShare will pretty much support, and you can connect through, and that does direct connections to those folks. You don't touch a Microsoft server at all. All right. Oh my gosh, Hugo, that is a huge comment. Calling a stored proc to pull for updates, with, which then calls another stored proc to get the updated data, just the delta, don't want to tax the t server, pushes the mes message to a message queue, which gets pulled by another job to put the data into NoSQL, <gasps> which gets pulled to display an email, to send an email that's been up, that data's been updated. Y you're insane. Dear Lord. But we, we do some I of those things. somebody's getting consulting prices for that. Yeah, absolutely. Because DP triggers are bad. <laughs> right. Actually, so, Rachel, regarding database triggers, I never thought database <laughs> triggers were bad to do, like, a little bit of logging, right? Oh, record changed here. Insert into my history table, you know, Rachel, you know, the whoever the user was that was logged in, Rachel updated this record. And then because I have the old record and the new values, I could copy some of that information in. And then that record's in the new table. 
let that go do some whatever stuff and it's off my business logic my, my business data tables right actually for stuff like that uh, I find they're actually perfect right stuff like logging which does not interrupt your transactions and, yeah. and stuff not the stuff that people pull with it which is you know you insert a record and then it inserts like five more delete something update something else and you can't even follow what it's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is alongside other procs and, you know, procedures and things like that. So and so that's what happens is it gets abused like that uh, instead of using them for stuff that's going to be of not consequence to the transaction. Oh, yeah. All right. So I understand for, for our project here, I understand... I'm going to go back to, I'm going to bring up the GitHub documentation here. We don't need triggers for this. We don't, it'd be nice to do triggers. And I'm actually working, I'm actually working on that in, in, in my F sharp shows, we're going to actually um, save that data into a different database that we can use to trigger this, this flow to present on the screen. It's face with triggers. Uh, well, not true. <laughs> Not triggers. We're going to do... Sounds like an Azure function to me, right? You send a little message somewhere and yeah. it triggers off some stuff. Yeah. At like a blob specifically, if it's an Azure object, I could see that being an Azure function. Exactly. So, all right, now, now I got to go back and I got to show you. On... Now, on that's something, if people haven't seen those yet, Azure functions are the bomb. They are. And we're, I'm actually working on that, uh, where is it? Over here, da, 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 da. Um, I don't see, oh, there's, thank you for the follow. Uh, let me back up one here. I've been, I started on Fridays, I do F-sharp Fridays. Uh, here it is, not wrong one, I clicked on the wrong one. We're doing, shoot, where's my, I had a project about this. It might be in stream tools under an issue. But the idea is we're going to push the data. There we go. With a web hook because GitHub has web hooks. So, oh, we'll, yeah. so we'll have a web hook trigger an Azure function that parses. Oh, here's what changed. We'll update the data store with that information. And then we'll notify the signal R service, which will reload from the data store. Or maybe it has that information coming along as a payload. And there we go. Now we can update. So there's a couple different ways that we can do this. But I'm doing this all in F Sharp on my F Sharp Friday shows. Woo! I know, right? Crazy. But if I get this, oh, thank you, Pac-Man Jr. for the subscription. Uh, three months in a row. That's awesome. Thanks so much. And Rachel, I actually match subscriptions and make a donation to Girl Develop It oh, on, nice. the, on their behalf. I want to make sure that, that women, underserved minorities, have a chance to learn how to write code just like we're doing here on stream. So thanks nice. for the contribution, Pac-Man. Um, but this we'll do on Friday and rewrite some of these things. And then when it gets loaded into that data store, I can still use the same service that I have in the widget to paint and upload that data. But oh, are you getting Rachel Reese on for this? Oh, you could add us both on. We could be fighting about this. It would be awesome. I don't have Reese <laughs> scheduled to come on. You're, of course, referring to Rachel Reese. Yeah. I should have her on for, for an F-Sharp Friday. And she's actually in Europe now. Yeah. Oh, you can always wait so until the timing... we go back to Europe. And then we can both do it from Holland. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You uh, know, like how I'm roping her into shenanigans. She's not anywhere to be found, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we're we're planning for that, we're, even without her. Um, uh, we'll see. You know, we'll talk about the schedule. See if we can make that happen. So, consultants put a BizTalk based ESB into our company, ESB Enterprise Service Bus. I'm ref I'm assuming you're of referencing. Of course, they left, and my team has to deal with it. Oh, I feel that pain. I know how that is. <laughs> um, T8Z says, why not pull data from from transaction logs? I I think you're not transaction logs, but transaction logs. I think you're referring to. Um, uh, SQL administrators sometimes don't like to make those readily available have to 
to the anonymous users that are connecting in from a database, right? There's a, a security level there that they don't necessarily want everybody to have access to. So depend, your mileage may vary. It may be open to you. You may be able to read it if you have a friendly database administrator. Some of us aren't so lucky. So, all right. So I understand from the GitHub API, um, if I go to get, uh, I think it's, um, if, if I want to get the commit st statistics, statistics, I want to make sure I bring this up properly, uh, from the GitHub developer's guide, that it returns a two, here it is, um, a word about caching, because GitHub caches, because if it's recalculating all your GitHub statistics every time, dear Lord, that's right. a lot of traffic that it has to recalculate when it paints somebody's web page. But it says here, if the data hasn't been cached when you query the statistics, you'll receive a 202 that indicates a background job is also fired to compile the statistics. Give the job a few moments to complete. Submit the request again. If the job has completed, the request will receive a 200 response with the updated statistics in the response body. And that's where I think I'm running into this problem where it's not updating properly. Mm, okay. So what I'd like to do, hey, Code for Veronica, thanks for joining us. With And that's the little coffee drinking emote that you see there. That's our friend uh, Suze Hinton. Her channel's emote. And the little .NET bot, that's subscribers to our channel here. Mr. Magoo, thanks for joining us. Um, lots of lots of friends from Germany tune in here live while we're broadcasting. Um, so what I want to do, Rachel, is I, wanted, I want to turn around. I'm using the OctoKit library right now to fetch statistics from, uh, from GitHub. In, in it, and it's not returning to me these um, HTTP status codes. So I think I need to turn around and use this get command to get specifically that repository's contributors and be able to get the 200 OK response and detect it and parse it appropriately. OK. Does that make sense? Right? Yep. Am I thinking this through properly? Maybe? You think yeah, so? Yeah, that looks like it. OK. So if I put that in so that now I have just those new contributors because I'm, I don't think I'm going to lose contributors, right? I'm going to have, here's the new contributors. Right. Then, so is this going to work the same way though, where it's going to give you a 202, then a 200 as well I, or no? That's what I, that's what I understand from, okay. from this bit up here. Right. So if I do an, if I, if I receive the information that says, Oh, there was an update. Make the request, I've got a 202, set a timeout, come back and check in 30 seconds. Do I still have a 202? Okay. Wait, wait 30 seconds until I get a 200. And then when I get a 200, who's the new contributor? Update my statistics. Or do I update my statistics or do I push down? Here's the update. Oh, we have a contribution from Rachel. You know, and it's, and it's five commits push that down and then let the JavaScript figure out where to put it into into the the ticker? What do you think? Or do I recalculate it on the server and push, here's your new counts? Wait, run those by again. Sure. So we're gonna, I have a service that identifies when there's an update in GitHub. Okay. I'm going to start, I think we need to start, uh, we need to insert a method that starts polling, looking for the 200 response code on the contributors. When it gets the 200 response code, right, because it's recalculated and it's not returning the 202 anymore. Identify who the new contributor is, what that new contribution was. And then do I either push that new contribution down. Oh, here's here's five commits from Rachel and place them into the ticker. Or do I re at that point go and recalculate, okay, for this project, here's all the contribution statistics and push that project's contribute uh, statistics and repaint the ticker. It seems easier to just squeeze the data value into the ticker, isn't it? Because that should be JavaScript on the client side that just has a stack of that data, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. So 
with this information, I'm going to go back over to the code. And I have, I actually created a repository model. So I'll go up here to my models, and I have a GitHub repository. And I have get last commit timestamp. And this I call once a minute to figure out, has there been a change in GitHub? And right here it is, right? If there's been an update, then here's the last update date. I'm not even indicating what the last update repository is. And that feels bad too. Hmm. Yeah, but that should just be coming down with anything that date or later, correct? Yeah, but I don't know which one of my repositories it was updated in. Right, this this is just returning a date okay. time. Do you need that? I mean, the ticker, <laughs> let's see. Ticker doesn't show any repos in there. Yeah, it does. Um, so there it just went by core wiki right above top corner. Just scroll oh. out and we'll see .NET Philly. That's a neat project we started. Oh, I just see. Started okay. in. So that's the project name up there and it's coming across. It's in the oh, middle of the screen. I see. It just uh, takes it a while in between right. projects. Right. So what I'm thinking okay. is we need to, re if we return also the repository name, then I know, oh, there was an update for this repository. And I can go and start the update, the fetch for just that repository, because this get is for a specific owner, specific repository getting the contributors. Yeah, that would work better then. So what I think we should do <coughs> what I think we should do is instead of returning a date time, what if we returned a value tuple of a string date time that has the name of the repository and then the last update date? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So I'll change this signature. Um, string. So instead of returning this last update, it'll be this last update and uh, the name of my repository is is this, it's this R that is actually, um, it's actually the user repository. So let's say uh, uh, R, no. Oh, I'm outside of the for each, rats. Oh, rats. Hmm, hmm. All right, hang on, updated repository. Um, I don't know what that is yet. Right, so right. if that's if that's two strings, do I have to initialize that? Oh man, like that, right? It still doesn't like it. Why not? <coughs> oh, assigned but never used. Okay, so then I can say updated repository equals r, and then I can pass back uh, string dots. Do I want to do format? If I want to pass it back... Mm, As a... Do I... Well, if you <coughs> want all those pieces, you don't want to format it. But if you just want, like, the date time, we could do, like, a too short date time or something like that. Well, uh, but I am passing back the date here as a date. But, but I, I need to... to but I want to pass okay. back the repository information so I know exactly which one to go update. I think I need to make this not just one string, but two strings. Okay. So then I can return updated repository, right, item one, <coughs> updated repository, item two. Yeah, okay. So now I know everything about it so that I can go and reload that data. Okay. <coughs> now, I have to figure out how to wire that up. Um, we don't need that one. I don't need this one. Let me close some of these windows over here that we don't need. GitHub, big GitHub face. <laughs> um, just and and then that laugh in the background. It's like, um, okay. So I'm going to return that information, and then there's two places this is used. Um, one inside of my controller where it's identifying, here's the last timestamp of it. 
that I pass <coughs> back here. This is item one, which is the date. And so this will get me the latest change date. That's okay. Which I don't think I actually use anymore, but whatever. And then the other place this is used is actually inside of my service. So here I need to, for right now, I'm going to make this just return item one. Oh no. Wait a sec. Get last commit timestamp. And I'm returning, yeah. Um, and we'll figure out how to do that. Item one. Okay, I'll figure out how to do the HTTP requests. Hey, Mr. Regs in the chat room, good to see you, one of our regular viewers. Um, but I want to actually push down that data when it has new information. So right now, I'm passing, right, so it, if there has been a change, here's where it detects that there's a change, and it raises this event that eventually calls and pushes the change down. And this event that I'm raising is updated event args. So the payload that you're suggesting that I pass down is just the, the new contributor information, right? Right. Okay. So my updated event logs, let's go update that with the new contributor information. So I actually have, here's the new information of, of this type that I already built called GitHub information, which has top week contributors, top month contributors, top ever. What? I didn't say start. No, don't start. I fat fingered an F12 in there. I'm sorry. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that launches a browser on my <laughs> side. I'm like, what's where'd this come host? from? This is weird. Okay. So I, I feel like instead of having this updated event orgs pushing this information about about the um, you know here's the complete set of calculated information. I think I just want to push just the update. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's create a new class instead of this one. And then I'll deprecate this. Okay. Uh, public class. There it goes. Uh, GitHub new contributors. Event args. See now power mode decided to take a powder there on me. Look at that. Hmm. It's doing so much. I see the commenters too like the uh, little confettis and celebrations when you type stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, it's so much fun. This is what you need when you have to present to the CEO and high-level management, and you want to show them a little bit of code. Yeah. You have to put that ad in in there. Right, and this is power mode. Got to turn that on. Make so they know coding is fun. <laughs> Um, all right, so so if I create a constructor here, yeah, I, I, you know what? Power mode is just not being very wow. responsive. Yeah, look at this. It's completely, like, saturated. That's lagging, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to turn it off. Ooh, oh, well. I know. We had it turned on. It was doing so well. <laughs> it got all partied out. It put... <laughs> Phil, you're all partied out, man. Um, okay. It had enough shenanigans. To enough. Point. Absolutely. So I need to tell it which repository it is, the username, and we know that it was just now. Um... There's going to be int for the num the the new number of commits, and then I'm just going to store those in properties. Right, so we'll do something like this. This dot username equals username. This dot new commits equals new number of commits, and then I'm just going to control dot onto these so I get these things. Okay, so I have that. I have my new argument here. Um, instead of raising with this, it'll be new GitHub, not nub, uh, new contributor event args. Okay, 
So string for the repository username, and then we'll after I finish this, we'll go and actually wire this up so that we can force it to update. So the repository was, um, well, I'm not getting it coming back from get last committed timestamp here. I, I kind of swallow that data. So I think I need to return date time and then a string for the repository name. And then I need to at some point go fetch that information. Ah, crap. Hmm. Hmm. Let's just return that for now. Okay. Because I, th I think, hang on, uh, last update equals, and then do the await here for this thing. Right? Uh, that, and then, I want to return um, last update item one, which is the date, and then last update item three, which is the repository name. Okay, so that's coming back here. So last update equals this. Last update is not that. Now it's a date, time, and a string. Oh crap. This is getting a heck of a lot more confusing. Um, well, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I have this last request that knows when the last request happened. If last, so last update is the date, time, and string, last committed, I'm, last, what is last update? Where'd that come from? That's this, this is a, all right. Unnecessary, the duplicates there? No, well, this is actually at the class level so that I can remember it in between. Uh -huh. So I think I need to say item one and then say item one so that I push the date into there and then I can pass back. All right, here's the update. So in here, to do, identify who the new update is and how much update. And we'll figure that out later. But I'm going to do a new GitHub new contributor event args repository. So I'll pass in that repository information, which will be, um, what was it, last update. Item two is the repository. The user, just to stub this out, we'll put it in Rachel, and we'll say five. Now, that doesn't work because updated is expecting this type of argument, so I'll change that to mm. like that, so that now works. And this updated event, where is it? It's being referenced one other place, and I think that's, this is where we're gonna jump in to send, start sending the message of here's the new information. Um, shoot, 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 shoot. I lost it. Where did it go? So this is identifying the last commit. Right? It's going to raise this event, which is here. Where's the thing that's listening to it? Okay, so get updated, which is this bit right here. Okay, so I'm going to receive now not GitHub updated event args. It's now GitHub new contributors event args. And I'm going to update GitHub. And I, this is where I now need to pass not the contributors, but the repository, the user, and the new number of commits. So it's not just, it's not that number of contributors, it's the repository, oh, better. username, commits. So now, now here's where I'm gonna need your help. So now I'm gonna send down, I'm gonna call the on GitHub updated method on the client, and instead of passing contributors, I wanna pass three arguments. So how do I change, I 
can I just give it an array of arguments to send down? You can actually do that, yeah. So or I you can, can send all three separate, and then you just define them separately in the uh, uh, JavaScript. Either or. Okay, so let's send down repository, username. Username and commits. Okay. So now on GitHub updated, which is inside of here, there's, uh, where is it that I wire this up? Uh, da, 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 da. Somewhere, oh. didn't you just do that? Yeah, here it is. Uh, I think this is it. There we go. So we wrote a class to kind of wrap up all the signal R start and connection stuff. Um, so when this class calls start, connect to GitHub groups all the way down, connect to write my GitHub McGitty, mm, GitHubby McGitHub face. Uh, thank you for the follow user, blue one. And Steve, you're getting a little sweaty there. You look a little tired. You should be after screaming that so much. I know. 2,500 times he's been screaming that on my stream. Um, but here it is. So this hub on, and then there's the on GitHub updated, right? So it, it's weird to me that we have a string for the function name here inside of our JavaScript that matches. Right. Yeah, so that's some of that new syntax that. I was talking about right there on 29. Um, you do the name we'll of your connection dot on, and in that on method, the first argument is the name of the client method that you're defining, and then there in your uh, hub is where you call it. Okay, so instead of creating a function, right, a, 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 an explicit JavaScript function, right. we're saying when you hear a command with this name. Yep, yep, just sit and wait and look for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, before the syntax was something like uh, $.connection.client. And then it would be on GitHub updated. Mm. Uh, so you would like set it up that way with a slightly different syntax than your normal JavaScript, but not too far off. Um, so here it's just using a method to create like a listener, basically. Okay. So um, it, should I continue coding through this, or you want to? Do you want to take no, the go ahead, code? Go ahead. Okay. So I'm now receiving from my client here, yep. and I, I like to. Is this a good practice, Rachel? I like to wrap up all the interactions that I want to do from my server side to push down to client side so that I don't end up having this magic string laying all over my code and all the different ways to receive and get at my context. I like to wrap that up as a client class that I can pass around and I have one way that's strongly typed that I can call all of those clients. That, that's actually a good thing to do because a yes, like you just said, you get the strong typing and uh, you're, only passing around one object as opposed to juggling multiple objects as well. So that should make things a little easier. And I, I can put all of all of my GitHub, in, not GitHub, whoo, SignalR Hub interactions in one place. I don't have to think about yep. going and finding it everywhere when I need to change how I interact with my SignalR Hubs. Yep. So it's repository username commits. So I'm going to receive here not contributors, but repository username commits. Now, do those field names, do they have to have the same variable name as what it I does? Passed? It does have to have the same signature, yeah. The same signature, but do, is... I always use the same variable names, and that shouldn't matter, but just that I do it so much. Um, okay. I'm saying, no, that shouldn't be a problem. I don't remember that ever being a problem. Okay. So let's, um, I have a log here just because I get paranoid about that kind of thing, making sure that my JavaScript works. But Be who does that? I know, right? JavaScript, developer, right? Developer, You'd want to test that or something? Developer, it's JavaScript. Developer, developer. Yeah. Who, who thinks that works? <laughs> <laughs> Using the same variable names simplifies structure. Good point, Janesco. Yeah, that's true. It makes it, it makes it easier to follow the data from, from the server to the client. What, who wants to do that? <laughs> who who does that i don't know all right so if no this... if you're a consultant you can't do that because you have to make the names confusing so that you can stretch out your billables i'm a terrible person i don't do Just that do it like that 
I just way. like to mock consultants who do things like that. Oh my gosh, that was There's a, a lot thing. of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to instead of calling. So I have an on updated method that's on my page, and I will call with repository username commits. All right. My gosh, Vicky TV. Oh, thank you for the follow. And uh, uh, thank you, Half. I'm not going to say your full name, but thank you, Half, for, for the follow as well there. You can see on the list at, on, at the bottom right of the screen, right above our Dev Intersection logo. Um, I try to keep things family friendly here, Rachel. And you invited me on the show? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? I know. Yeah, but it just says half cocked. That's not a bad word. It's not word. that If bad. you just said half. If you left off the ED part, then perhaps. Maybe, yeah. Um, oh, our friend John Galloway's here. Should be my repository, my username, my commits, so we know whose they are. Yes. Wait, wait. It should be username, username, face. <laughs> <laughs> commits McCommitty don't, face. Don't do that. <laughs> repository McRepo face. Repository <laughs> McRepo face? Yeah. Oh, I, I get it. I get it, uh, half cocked. That's no problem. I, um, And user blue one says, will there be a recorded session to view later? Yes. You'll be able to always uh, go to my uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C Sharp Fritz, and you'll see... Uh, an archive of all the videos that we've done, and also Twitch hosts a video on demand for 30 days after we've recorded it, so you can watch it here. Half male chicken. No, no, yes. no. My repository. Somebody should make username, make repository. It's a good thing I'm Irish, and I'm not offended by that. Uh, I am Irish. That is true, even though my name's Fritz. Um, all right. So I'm going to receive that information, and then the actual page is over here where I've defined, where is it, this, so hub on updated, and right now I'm receiving contributors, so it was, let's make sure I have it right, I'll actually just copy it, that's how lazy I am. Why uh, copy and paste code? Who would ever do that? I like know. literally everybody on Google ever. Yeah. Um, let's put these, so uh, I'm, I'm going to do formatting here. I should be able to say, right, what, what is it for the JavaScript interpreted text? It's, uh, it's back tick, but then, right, do I do something like this? Be able to say repository. Are you just talking about a string literal here? Yeah, yeah, and I want to just output that log information so I can see it. Uh, just, yeah, just type out the, yeah, the name of it. And you could just do plus sign to concatenate if you want. Oh, that's, come on now. That's, what? That's so. So when I won programming. No. That's old school. Yeah, why? We can do string interpolation. Yeah, we barely had bytes to move around when, when I was a kid. Listen to you. <laughs> Back in my Get day. Off my lawn. <laughs> Get off it. my lawn. Oh my gosh. And no, commits. And then we're done. That's so that's yeah. so and, effective and, though. And and next you're gonna tell me that I shouldn't be using single quotes on my JavaScript and I should be okay. using double quotes. Okay. It works. It's yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andres. There's here's right. We should be using, and I agree with Andres, we should be using the string interpolation so we can do its dollar curly brace, right? Just like we have in uh, in C-sharp now. We can do string interpolation here. Yeah, that's true. And that it just works. Thank you. I forgot the syntax. Um, John Galloway writes to goes to write a code analyzer to make fix variable names. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> uh, I've I've stepped on it now. All right, I'm gonna pull this down just so I can see the format of my marquee information up here. So, so I have 
Um, user blue one. Single tick in JavaScript to confuse the .NET masses. Yes. Yes. So right now I do this marquee destroy and update incoming. But I'm, receive, I'm going to receive one notification. Here it is. Here's the new person's update. And now, how would I do this if I was doing streaming data? Would streaming data work better here? You know, what, how, how do you recommend folks approach this? So you're getting in little chunks and you're putting it into a partial, right? Right now I use a partial to format it because I have the exact same th format that I use again and again, and I call it contributor ticker segment. Okay. Well, yeah, that's going to be the same, right? You're If you're using a partial or a view component or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't need to change. So that's perfectly fine for that ticker. And then what we already talked about, just grabbing those last little bits uh, with the repo, the commits, and the timestamp, and just squeeze it in there. Uh, but I don't know what that data. I assume it's just a just a slab of JSON, right? It's, that you're getting. It's a um. Where'd it go? I have a. Where's the partial? There's a partial here. I promise. Over there. No, where? This one, contributor, it's it's shared. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, there it is. So all I'm doing is outputting item.author, item.commits. So if I'm updating the same author, I might need to move them in the marquee as well. If they're a new author, I have to find oh, out where they I are. See. Well, so if it's well, technically, if it's the same author that updated the same commit or the same repo, rather, um, right. that would be where you would have to update it. Right, and, and push that name. So I think right. if it's a new one, just squeeze it in there. Yeah, just tack it on to the end, yeah. and and then yeah, okay, hang on. So let's, if I wrap this in a span, right, I could put like a data on this, right? I yeah. could do data dash author, right? And I can put uh, at yep. item author here, and then I could do, it, do data dash commits and put their commits here. But then, and I, I don't need the text tag anymore because I have my own HTML tag. Um, but I need to replace the commits over here for this author. I mean, an author name doesn't have a space in it, so I could do a, a, a split on where the space is and replace the commit number, right, once I know what this is. Hmm. Wait, what's, what does that item look like then? Is that just a string of stuff crammed together or is it separate JSON pieces? It's, it's just a HTML bit here that's crammed together. Right. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's a, what's an item object? An item object is a GitHub contributor. GitHub contributor. So if you have all those separate pieces, and you already have the commits there, isn't that going to be the updated amount of commits? You're going to actually have to do something to find, to see if it's in the DOM already there, right? Yeah. And update it. Yeah. Right, and the goal here is to have a smooth update of that instead of the blink that happens when, um, when it just does a forced reload, right? Oh, you just want everything, don't you? Where is it? Where is it? I have, oh, I have the perfect, I have the perfect sound drop for that this, comment you just made there. I'm this is go. why jQuery actually exists, that kind of stuff. Yes. So there's a tiny irony there in added sound and signal R. Tiny irony? Tiny irony. I'm going to find this sound effect and I'm going to play it. Okay. It is, there it is. It can be done exactly how I want it. See? The only yeah. question is, are you the man to do it? Actually, Rachel's the woman to do it. See how this works? Um, it's, I, 
I had the perfect Heisenberg sound drop there. <laughs> All right, so uh, you need a dedicated soundboard. I have one, User Blue. It's um, it's my stream deck that I have here. I just haven't don't have it loaded with everything for every show. Um, I need to work on that. Um, okay, is your controller not updating the model for you again? Or a soundboard widget? Soundboard widget's nice, but I've got a stream deck. I don't need a widget. Um, because the stream deck is effectively a widget. Do you know what I mean by a stream deck, Rachel? Um, maybe. <gasps> this like is the coolest I don't... toy. So here, let me show it here on screen. Okay. So this is, this is 15 buttons with programmable LCD screens that I can wire up to do all kinds of things here on stream for us. And it doesn't have to be on stream, but I can tell it to launch apps. I can tell it to change uh, scenes, but I've got it programmed with all the different sound effects like. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so it's but, like a media board. Exactly. So yeah, it's okay. more than just, but a soundboard widget as an extension, maybe that might be cool to do in the future. Um, so it, right as part of these widgets that we're embedding here, um, I think th I like this GitHub, GitHub scoreboard the best, um, because it's, it's showing the contributions that our friends are giving. All right. I've gone way in, off into the deep on this. So should I set up two spans here or should I set up one? I think I can set up one here and make this happen. Yeah. Start with one. One's fine. Yeah. Yesterday at Twitch Dev London, they showed a Minecraft extension where the extension controlled buttons. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I need to get to a Twitch Dev conference. I'm actually going to TwitchCon in October? September. October. It's in October. Th that's going to be a lot of fun. I right. didn't even know they had conferences. for. Oh, I just thought it was gosh. just a streaming platform. Oh, Apparently my gosh. There's more to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I have the data coming down. Um, we can take a look at the format that it's in and, and then figure out how to update this. So let's run it here so we can see the, okay. the data format and then we can break it. Yeah, break it. Um, that's how I learn is I break things and then fix them. Gratuitous parentheses around expression. Did you see that? So this is my collection of stream tools that I have available. Oh, I see. Um, the the current viewers, this is the vi the widget that you see right below me here. Okay. Uh, current followers, that's right over here. And then I had a follower goal that I was using on stream, but we've met all my goals, so I'm not using it anymore. But this one is the GitHub configure contributors information, and this actually opened a browser also on Rachel's machine, if I remember correctly. It, it did, yes. So now she can actually open and use in her browser the the dom explorer and actually see what's going on with this as well so you can see how it formats and lays out everything nicely for us now that's not too bad developers, right developers, developers, rickety rocket developers, thank you for the follow i appreciate mm. you joining us S steve you're getting a little tired there buddy um so as this is presented right now, if I look at, so here's SMAB, data author, SMAB UK, data commit, and I have an ID around it for the month, the week, and whatever. Um, uh, tell you what, Janescu, why don't you open an issue? <clears throat> why don't you open an issue uh, in, the, in the project repository and we'll talk more about it over there. I, I really like what you're thinking about a soundboard widget. So so I have, I don't have the name of the project around this. <clears throat> so I think, right, so that we can capture and figure out exactly where, where Rachel's contributions need to go. I, do we need to wrap these, or, or do we put a class on the span that says, here's the project name, the repository name, so that we can locate, here's the five from Rachel that we need to add on to the week. Here's the five from Rachel we need to add on to the month and the five for the all time. What do you think? What keep adding? I'm not sure I follow what you mean there. Keep adding them up and keeping track of that or? So, so the approach that we're taking here is we're going to go find, right, when we, when we receive 
information. Um, when we receive, I'll come back to your question, Hugo, in just a second. When we receive information that, oh, we, we've identified a commit from Rachel on this project, Stream Tools or Core Wiki, you know, whatever your project might be, we need to identify which of these spans, statistic spans, the week, the month, the all time one, and then we need that we're going to go update, right? So we need to go find tops for this week, right? Uh, Rachel has a commit, so we need to add Rachel's information in to the this week's collection, which right now has no contributors. So we'll need to add an entry there that says span data author Rachel commits five or whatever the number is, and then the appropriate text to highlight there, right? Okay. And and then we need to come back and do that for not just the week contributions, but the month and the all time for that one repository. Okay. All that data comes down when you're asking for it too? All of that data comes down. Well, th so these various entries are here, right? All that I'm going to be receiving is I just, I just identified five new commits from Rachel. Okay. In core wiki, right? Whichever repository it is. I think all we do is go find that location and just push the data in. Oh, so you just want to find which span has that data and grab that? Is that it? Grab it and sum it or add to the end of it. Okay. Here's a new contribution. Okay. Um, all right. So the, the question from Hugo Dahl is, is Rachel's browser pointed to my local host? What's it say on the address bar for your browser? It says localhost. Six, uh, the port, it looks the same too. 62574. So there you go. It, so is... it appears that like the Visual Studio instance I have up actually is in the, like as if you hit F5 or did a debug, start debugging, uh, because the the little stop debugging is activated and you can't start it and you're in debugging mode and all that. So it looks like it just spinned up the local host uh, <clears throat> for me. That's basically what it did. So the um, live share is actually That's tunneling cool. that request back and forth mm -hmm. between us. And if I come up here to the sharing bits and I look at manage shared servers, you can see Fritz stream tools port 62574 is shared. Now, I could also do up here, I could share a read-only terminal because I'm never giving Rachel read-write access to <laughs> my hard drive. And she knows it, too. <laughs> she knows what a bad idea that is. Of course. But if I do say shared terminal read-only, it's um, it should open a terminal here for me and connect us. And uh, oh, there yeah, it is down I there. see terminal popping up. So now she can see what's going on down there in the terminal. She can't actually do anything because I'm smarter than that. But it's there. So um, People won't even give me their calculator at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm never letting you touch my phone. How many people <laughs> have you taken the phone of and just started filling in information and sending messages? <laughs> Enough until they nobody will let me touch their phone anymore. <laughs> it's a bad Whoa! idea. It's yeah. a bad idea. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so to identify exactly which one of these are the the correct items for this repository, I think we want to op open up the span here. Or maybe do we put a data repository? Do we put extra data tags on this for uh, each one HTML of these? The HTML5 data dash yeah. ones. Well, you can't. You're already using them, right? So you might as well be consistent. Right. So do I do I put should, do you think I should put repository and then top month as additional data dash properties here so that I can go and find all of them? Oh, I see. Uh, for searching, yeah, you're because you're going to need to search on user and repo, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have that. Maybe maybe I could put a class on this so that I can do I can do a standard. HTML DOM search on the class name and find that it. Too. Yeah. All right, so let's try that to start. So the item is the contributor. Oh, wait a sec. 
I don't have the the I don't have the repository name being passed into this segment. I'm only passing in this list of contributors, which are authors and commits. I don't have the repository name coming down as well. Don't. I know. Um, Hugo asks, so, so the host is, so to say, open, and there's no way back from the host to the contributor. And for apps like WPF WinForms, something akin to remote apps. What's the general idea, Andres asked. We're, um, we're receiving a notification that there was an update to the data that we're showing on our scoreboard up top there. And we want to update that scoreboard live without having that ugly refresh that happens when you, when you refresh a web page. Because that's what it does right now. What is the parent that the spans go in? Can you just put a class on that and don't need it in each span? Oh, that's a good idea. Galloway. I John think always has the good ideas. You're giving him too much credit. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to go into our code here where it actually says here's tops for the week. And we can put a class. And let's call the class repository underscore and then the repository name. Repo dot, I think it's just repository. There we go. And I think that works. Right, if I copy and paste that down into each one of these. There we go. Da, da, da. So now I so now I can locate each one of those people for their repository by looking for well, I'll get three of those. And then I'll be able to go down into each one. Or mm, wait a sec. Wait a sec. Yeah, okay, okay. So tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me how we can... There's got to be an, an easier, faster, better way to do this. Um, I, I'm not going to destroy this, and I'm not loading the data, and right, this is effectively doing that purge reload. I'm going to comment this out for right now. Right, you wanted to stop doing that. So instead, I've received this information. Repository username commits... So do you want to help me out with some JavaScript here? Yeah, by doing what? What do you want to do here? <laughs> so why don't we... And, and this is great because we're in a Razor template. The Razor templates don't get rebuilt. We can actually leave, stay in debug mode here and we can tinker with our script here and get it to reload. Um, I'm a big fan of descendant selectors, John says. Just put the class name on the parents. I think that's a good idea. So... Um, so if we go and use that new format here, look for the spans that have a class of repository and then right. underscore whatever the name of the repository is that was passed in. I'm right. Gonna... It looks like you're using jQuery there anyway, right? Yes. So why not dollar it and then look for that? Uh, what the hell do you just call it? The name of the repository. Okay. Do you want to write that code or should I? Go ahead. Oh, look, listen, listen to you. You go do it, Fritz. Well, yeah, you got to do it. Well, plus there's like a little bit of a lag with uh, this Visual Studio. So I think it'll be a little bit weird. I, I don't want to like so if I do anger the bandwidth gods here. The bandwidth gods? Oh, it's yeah. taking a little bit to update on your side. Yeah. Okay, so this will give me the top month, top, right, the, the three spans for top week, top month, and top all time. So then uh, there's three of them, so I need to do like an each across it. And I'm going to get an yep. element, right, which is going to be that span element. So let's call it yeah, top so you can just, L. Just do, yeah, dot each there. Um, oh, it's a function that I passed that into. All right, fine. Yep. Function top L, and then I can do my thing in here to go locate and format that data. Um, I'll be able to know whether it's top all time, top week by inspecting the ID. No. Does it really matter though? Whether it's top week, top month? If I just received that data, I should be able to just say, who cares? Go reach into this and either find Rachel, right? My user 
and add a new record. Find Rachel and update her record with a new number of commits or add a new record to the end of the line. Right. Well, and it shouldn't matter unless you actually want that top month and top week. But it looks like you have that in the ticker, so you're going to want it at some point, right? Well, I've already got that text in place. Mm. Ah. So I, ju I think I just need to write... Uh, the, yeah, just... Yeah, you're just looping through now, and then you can tally them or do whatever you're going to do with it. Yeah. Um, le let me open... Oh, Retry Life. Thank you for the follow. That's... I I need to create a widget for um, keeping track of who has the cool avatar of the day. <laughs> because sometimes we get some pretty good ones coming through. All right, so now... I'm on the top element. I want to find I want I want to find out if data.author exists with my user's name on it. Um, how do I do that in in right am I going to do something like it it's a attribute. So what do I do? I don't want to do span. I want to do Oh yeah, you could search by the attribute in jQuery. Let me see if I can remember the syntax. Uh, gee, it's been a while. Right, and then it's like, it's like children, right? So I, I'm being passed that element. Well, if you're for each or you don't need to do the children because it's going to go through all of them, right? Well, I'm doing a for each on the top, e each one of the, the segments for, right, for the statistic, right? Top all time, top this week, top for the month. Okay. So um, retry life. We're, we're updating that scoreboard ticker that you see up at the top of my screen. So we can try and get it to update a little bit more real time. Oh, look at this. Andres is there telling There it us, is. Yes. Data. I was like, what is that syntax again? It's been a while. So if I say top L and then the, the descendant, right, is, is it descendants? No. I don't think you even need that because you're for eaching through that. There's only those four items, right? And they're going to have that data author, data commit on them, aren't they? Right. Or is it underneath each one of those? Well, in, so let's go back to the browser so we can see what it looks like. So we'll be on this one, top month. Wait, I'm not seeing your browser. Hold on. Well, you have your own browser. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess who closed it. Oh, guess who closed it? Feels bad, man. Well, it was hogging up the bandwidth. Things were slowing down around here, so. So Andre says we could do a uh, selector with data author. Um, a trib blue one says we could do the dot a trib. Well, dot a trib, I thought would. Um, I thought that would allow us to set an attribute. Think that could do either. Well, either sets or reads. I didn't think it would allow us to find based on the value of an attribute. Oh, I see. I bought socks and a new jacket today. I look cool now. You didn't have socks before? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I'm at this. I thought it, there's like a dot children or something. There are, but I don't think you need to do dot children if you're for eaching through it. It's already eaching through the children. Well, but I'm. Hang on, hang on. Let me refresh the screen. Now that I have the uh, the thing. Right. Uh oh, I broke it. Oh no. Hmm. Okay. Have you seen this error? Let me refresh and see if it, yeah, I'm 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 dead at this point. Um, where's John Galloway? Is he still out there? Nope, John. Yeah, there's John. Um, so if you have an application running, it gets confused right now between two one and two one one when you try to refresh a razor page and it does the dynamic recompilation. Even though Oops. I've only referenced one in my project. Yeah, I have not gotten this one. Yeah. Um, so I actually have to stop and restart the application. And I, I can't even use a .NET watch on this. Um, properties, I'm pointing on my project, I'm pointing to .NET Core 2.1. 
if I do an edit on the project, right, and I look here, netcore app 2.1, and I, I tried pushing these to, I tried pushing that one to 2.1.1, but 2.1.0 here, let me get rid of that, so that I try and stay just on one version of ASP netcore. Who does that? I, I'm trying, I'm trying all the new things. <laughs> Might need a NuGet config. Uh, so I have a new. I had a NuGet config in play here. Mm, it's not there in my solution files. Um, let me see. Do I have a NuGet config? No, I don't. Uh, let's see here. It depends on the desert. You're probably cooler. <laughs> All right. They're talking about that jacket and socks deal. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Go back into contributors information. Oh, look, it's not even scrolling now. I broke the JavaScript so good. Oops. I know, right? Um, so span data author data commit. But see, there, there's the class up top here, repository underscore fritz.streamtools. So the repository name I'm looking for that's easy to find. I mean, I can can I. I can concatenate that together to find it. But then I need to go through and find underneath of that, right? The data, data author that matches. Could you try the following in the Firefox console? All right. Uh, dollar tick. Let me grab that syntax that you've got for me. And let's see here. In the console. Console here. Ah, see, I've got an extra scam warning. Yeah, I know. It's not letting me post. Uh, da, 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 da. I thought I copied that. It's not letting me copy and paste. Is this all set in my project? No, I think there was a, a bad reference in there. Give me a second, we'll take a look at that. Um, it's not letting me paste into it. Please type allow pasting below. Are you kidding? <laughs> now I can do it. That's weird. All right, so repository repo is, uh, let's try core wiki, data author equals whoever. Um, let's say this guy, Parathon. Hey, cool, it found it. All right, so that might work. Um, but let's go figure out this, I'm missing a, I have an extra parenthesis here I need to fix. Oh, and I've overloaded I've overloaded Twitch now. Um, okay, so each, so this finishes that, that finishes that. Um, I don't need that one. All right. I think you'll need to type it on every single refresh. That's a security feature? Yeah, good luck. What a pain in the neck. Feature. <laughs> so repository, and then I can do uh, not percent repository data author equals and then pass in the author name which is right username yep like that yep all right so that'll get me a reference to to this element okay cool so so if we call that var author element, um, we actually we should get a collection of those. The Chrome Dev Tools has become an attack vector, such as when people get a call from Microsoft support. Oh, wow! I hadn't thought of that. That's a little crazy. 
So this should actually match several, right? Because if I have if I have Rachel in there several mm-hmm. times, top for the week, top for the month, this could match as many as three. Yep. Um, so let's call this author elements. Um, and if it doesn't match any, then I need to add it to all three. I agree, Mr. Magoo. The, the, the Microsoft support people will tell you in your console, oh, just type allow pasting. You know, it'll let it go through. Just like when they tell you to open reg edit and they say, oh, it's okay. Click that allow admin privileges, right? Except what they could say possibly it, go wrong? They say it with a Nigerian accent at that point. Huh. Right? Um, typically Nigerian, right? I've actually heard, had some Asian folks uh, call as well. Um, okay, so for each one of these, if there are any, but if there aren't any, I need to add it to each one of the repository elements. Yep. Oh, well, you see what you get with that one first. Okay. Sure. Well, this is only going to trigger if the hub is updated. Oh, that's true. Unless I call it directly, right? I mean, this is a function call. I could call this directly, right? right? Yeah. But no, go ahead then. If oh, We'll just wait for it to update. No, it, it'll never update because we're not merging code into the GitHub repository. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. Um... I feel like this is going to be almost annoying, but um, so I want to do a test. If author elements is null, then I need to add it to all three. Actually, if it's if it's null or if it's less, if the count is less than three, then I need to go figure out which ones to add it to. Right. Mm hmm. Hmm. And actually, I don't need to do this as an each. I need to just, I don't even need this. I need to do. That's why you said when you do the each, you're getting each of those individually. So then that uh, one so where it does var author elements should be looking at each individual one. And I don't think there's any sub nodes under, under that. Yeah. So if I do it that way. So you should be able to do that at the top level. Right. So now I'm actually, I'll, I'll only get those one or two that are out there. And I can update the number of commits All right. and put it on there. And then after this, say, okay, you found this number of these. You need to add the new ones as needed. Yep. Okay. So are you wishing... Where you... is the add the new as needed function that we could have used for the last 20 years now? <laughs> yeah, right? Like in every data access library ever. Mm-hmm. The, the, what do they call it? The insert or update command, Yeah, right? yeah. Um, D Legion, thank you for the follow. Upsert, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, the upsert command. Upsert. Um, are you wishing you had SignalR send the entire set of data for regenerating the spans? Um, that's not bad either. It doesn't look like there's a terrible amount of data because no. you're just getting stats on repos. So... You know, even if there were a few hundred users and repos and stuff, it's not going to be that big of a data set. Well, I only bring back the top five right now. Oh, okay. So, five. <laughs> right. Five for one repository in those three categories. 15 data points, uh, 30 data points with name and number of... So, do I really need to go through and find all of these things and push and update it? Or do I just... I think Mr. Magoo's onto something. Just oh, get... you could grab all of it at that point. It's not that much data. Yeah. Uh, something about the screen flickering now. What was you had a concern about that? Right. So right now I have it. It, it doesn't. 
well, I, I do a fetch for all of the data, and I say, go just reload the whole damn thing and load it in there. Right? I, I, I was destroying the entire marquee. Go get the, the, the contents from the server for the entire marquee and repaint it. And that's the flicker that it... Mm, I don't want to do all of that. But if I were to say, go get this repository's information from the server and replace each one of those with the new mm -hmm. values. That's not too bad. All right. So I could actually back this off to where we were when we started. No! Oh, come on. I love that Control-Z action here. If Karnak was turned on that showed all my keystrokes, It'd be just full of control Z right now. Mm. There's got to be a point where it's like, you know what? Why don't you just want to scroll through your history? Mm. So I was doing a destroy and I was replacing it with update incoming while I was loading the data. And then when it's done loading everything that's inside of my marquee, rebuild the marquee and insert it into that. So if instead I'm pushing down the, well, if I'm pushing down the repository and the username, I could just request and say, go get me just those pieces for that repository, right? Load that with Ajax here and insert, right? Grab those couple pieces and load them in. Do a, do a dumb replace. That would work. Right, just yeah, just rebuild the one repository Mr. Magoo is saying. And yes, I am talking to Mr. Magoo. So then instead of having instead of having these data author bits here, I can get rid of that. And instead of having class on each one of these pieces here, I could put it just on the outer span, right? And select all of it. Yeah, get it all in one shot. Th that was classic over-engineering by me. You know? Well, we would never do such a thing. Never. So if I call this span ID equals and then put repository like that. Uh, yep, and then go to the end of this where it does finishes the for loop for that. So now I could fetch just that one repository and reload. So if I do bring this back in, I don't need the update incoming. And instead of getting marquee and then everything underneath of it, I can actually just grab, right? It was a pound repository underscore and then repository, right? But I need to change these. Underscore and then repeat a name, yeah. To backtick, and then I don't need to rebuild the marquee here. I'm not. I'm not loading it into the marquee. I'm loading it into this same value. Right. Looks it. And then I don't even need a callback function. Nor do I need to destroy. Huh? Huh? There we go. Uh, no, I no, I forgot a tick. There we go. I th think that'll work. What do you think, Mr. Magoo? Do I have that right? Uh, Rachel and I think that's right. Um, now I've done it over here. Fix this. My GitHub widgets all stopped running. Um, oh no. Oh no. Now I've done it. Right, so just taking a look there, I think we're in good shape for this. I'm going to close out this bit down here because I don't need that anymore. Um, And I should be...
be able restart that. Okay, let's see how that works now. I wasn't watching. Reading the guide about partial updates to marquee. Uh -huh. Deleting code feels great, doesn't it, Andre? Mm -hmm. Andreas? Oh my gosh. Okay, so GitHub contributors information. So there's the marquee loading. And I don't have any JavaScript errors. Now I think, I think I wrote a test method in my controller here that we can use to force through an update. Okay. So test, um, the information about Now I'm going to need to restart this because my test method doesn't work properly just yet. Mm. All right. So the idea that I had was to, to do a test to make sure that my JavaScript is updating properly. Right? It, do you run into that, Rachel, when you're working with SignalR? How do I make sure that I've got data loading from my, from my SignalR into and repainting my user interface properly or calling the right method and doing that? Yeah, thing? making sure that you're getting the client side is a little clunky. Yeah, so, so what I did, and you can see here, I wrote a little test method, um, and I don't need new GitHub information. I don't need new contributors. But I wanted to push down and force it to do that update. So what I'm doing right now is I'm saying GitHub service last update is this value, which, right, because that value updates, when my service comes through, it'll see that there was an update. No, that won't work. Will it? Right, I want to get this event to to rerun, but it's not actually going to go get new data from the from the server. I actually what's what's it doing then? So, so instead of it getting data from the server like that right now, I'm actually. Are you going to make it into a little mock? Yeah, I want to. I want to, you know, mock okay. that this update happened. Okay. Go fetch it. Uh, maybe you could just handcraft some JSON in there or something like that. Is that what you want to do for a mock? Or because it looks like you were just actually hitting the service. Yeah, I don't. But I don't think I need to hit the service. Well, it won't help if you're not going to get any data because it's not been updated. Right. I want to I want to force it to get n new data in like test uh, mode. Yeah. So I don't know what will force it like uh, a new time stamp. What will force it to get new data? Well, a new a new time stamp of data retrieved from okay. GitHub would. But I I don't think we're testing that part. I think we're right. We're testing that when this method is called that it gets data and replaces it on screen. Okay. But since it's doing all of it, you could just call this method, right? Yeah. I could call this method directly. Right. You just do that. But how do I, and then I need to force it to load different data. Oh, uh, the different data. Uh, so right, what can so you I know pass something changed. To, yeah, what could you pass to GitHub to get it to do that? So maybe. Can you fudge something? Maybe I can fudge something. When it goes to get contributors and it builds this out model, maybe I can also pass in some stub data here. And a string count. Okay. And, and if that data is present, add it into the model? Possibly. I heard typing. I didn't see anything happening. You're not seeing it in your Visual Studio? Let me double check here. Click the button in the top corner so you can see where I am. Right, and then if I say out model, right, and the out model is a collection of GitHub information. So I would have to say dot first, where the repository equals the repository that was submitted and then go find each one of these contributors and add in that username and count. Let's force it into the top week. Can I say add? Ooh, yeah, I can just say add. New GitHub contributor. 
and I'll say author equals username commits equals count. So now if you do give it this extra information, we'll kind of force it in and return that data. Okay. Wait, string isn't bad job. There we go. Yeah, right. So now to test this, I could actually put on the end of this repo equals, and I'll use one of my repos, and uh, what is it? Username equals Rachel, and count equals 1,000. Very busy, Rachel. Very, very mm. busy. So now if I run this, I should be able to call this method directly and get it to, right, get it to reload, right? Hopefully. Hopefully. And it's this integration test that feels weird and tricky. Um, all right, so if I say this dot, right, it was hub. Where is it? Where's the hub? Right, that hub object that this is hanging off of. Oh, look at that, it's actually hiding inside my function. Hmm. Um, let me move this outside. Can I, can I refresh? Is it gonna work for me? No. What does that say? It's, it's that razor rebuilding error. Oh. Yeah. All right, so GitHub control contributors information. All right, so if I have 12 into this, and if I say hub dot, there we go, on updated. And um, it doesn't matter what I pass here. Uh, oh, those should be strings. Duh. Okay. So core wiki, top for the week, top for the month. And I think I test put it into just all time. No, didn't reload it. Hmm. Let me put a breakpoint here and let's see what we get to pop up. Okay. I'll call it again. Okay, I'm not hitting my breakpoint, which means my code's wrong. Um, where is it? Repo equals and username equals and count equals. Right, so that question mark syntax that should have reached in. Should. Uh, no, it's not a global object, Andres. Um, hmm. Right, those... Those are the query string arguments, right? Repo, username, count. So that should have called this, right? Go back to the console, force the method call, and nothing. Well, okay, hang on. So let's, let's walk through this. So it is doing that log here, is it actually calling this load? Doesn't look like it. Wait, what log? Where's the log that it's doing? Uh, this console.log on line 110, right? If I look in the browser, it, it's actually writing out the mm, information okay. that I passed into it. Um, hmm. So it's getting to here, so there's that. Right. Oh, missing the uh, slash API. Oh, boy. No, we're not passing an API on this one. This isn't... Oh, wait a sec. I modified the wrong method. I modified the wrong method. Okay, this one's on me. It should be up here in contributors information. This one's on me. I modified the wrong... Oh, uh, now you've confused me. So I actually have a method out here that'll allow me to return that contributors collection as an API. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's what I thought you were doing. I there. put it I put it on the wrong right. This one returns it just as data. So I was actually hitting and returning the wrong data. Now if I oh. put the breakpoint here. Oh, I see. Yeah. I have two. Yeah, that's the wrong method. Okay. One that returns just the JSON and another one that returns the full formatted HTML. Okay. So if we try over here, it does hit that out model properly. Right. So this is, oh, that's actually going to error out, isn't it? Oh, man. If string it dot is null or empty, repo, then we're going to do that stuff. If we actually have test data. Try again. Commander for easy access to tabbed command PowerShell windows. Okay, that sounds cool. So let's see. All right, so there's my data. It is loading now. So if I force the on updated call, it should update top of the week contributors. It didn't hit my breakpoint. So here's core wiki, top of the week. This is what it should have reloaded, but it didn't actually hit there. Um, still not hitting my breakpoint. Are you kidding? Uh, let's look at that. GitHub contributors information, which should be contributors information here. Passing in that information. So let me just try navigating to that and see what happens. Right? I should be able to Do see it. something. Right. Okay, so it hit that. That's still a, a thing. Um, sequence contains no matching element. I don't have my repository naming match there, but it's still, what am I doing wrong? Um, dot, if I, t I'll make sure this equals by doing string invariant, right? Um, right, the invariant culture ignore case, so it always gets that coming back. Right. Uh, all right, so that should work now. But why am I not getting it to to get that? Could you see what's going on on the network tab? Yeah, we'll take a look at that in just a second. I think that's a good place to next look, Andres. Good thing we're testing it like this, right? Because this would be a pain in the neck to try and do. Right. Right, I mean, we're testing the client directly here because we think we have the server working properly. So if I do that, it didn't hit my endpoint. Now what Andres is saying is, well, let's take a look at the network tab. So groups, GitHub, all right, so I've got that loaded. I'll hit the console again, force this, to, and you know what? It didn't make the get down here. That's weird. So it did the log, but it's not doing this dot load. Right. Is it not? Is it not finding that? Oh, don't tell me I got to reload because I changed that script. Don't tell me. I think you do. <sighs> Man, what a pain in the neck. All right, contributors information, that's loading. Reload so we get the network, hit the console. Didn't hit it. Um, I'm wondering if it's not finding pound repository repository because it's not to the point earlier, there it is. Yeah, the 
it was case sensitive. All right, so now it's going to reload, add that data. There it is, top of the week, Rachel 1000. So if I hit it again, well, let's refresh the screen. I think we got it. I think we got it. So I'm actually going to wait till it comes on screen and then fire it so we can see it refresh right, right. there. And then all I've got to do is figure out how to do my my console stuff, my um, HTTP client stuff, and I can do that later. That's not a SignalR thing. So here comes CoreWiki. Top week. Now why does it already have you? A little, le a little letter causing fuss. Somehow seems very familiar. I know, Voxy. Oh my gosh. What a pain in the neck. It's always one little character causing a big ruckus. I know. That's our entire industry, is yeah. that. Semicolons, yeah. right? Um, what a pain in the neck. All right, here it comes. So core wiki, top for the week. Now why are you always coming through as top on the week now? Like, it's loading that test data no matter what now. Caching? Is it caching it? No. I don't know. I don't think. Is it doing any? Yeah, it's doing some client caching, right? Are you getting the mock data and the, the regular data? It Did we miss something? It feels like it is. Yeah. But, uh, well, here, let's... Why am I waiting for it to go by? Let's just inspect and go find it, right? Seek and you shall find. I know, right? Core wiki. Top of the week. It's there. Why is it coming back? That That's the best part of programming. You're sitting there. Oh, this code does not work. I have no idea why. And then 10 minutes later, oh, the code works. I have no idea why. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is telling me that, all right. So there's Stream Tools, there's Core Wiki, and it's already got pre-populated. How did it save that data? It, it was just nice. Are you sure you don't have something running or something? Positive. Is it, hang on, get recent contributors, has an out model. Here's the cache. Is it pushing it back into the cache because I add it to it? And it has that reference? Right, is this a, is this a reference type issue? Because I'm, I, because the know. reference exists in the, oh my gosh. I'm willing to bet that's what this is. Because I just add it to it. I know, Voxy, I know. I think that's exactly what's going on here is I've added it to it and it remembers it now. Right. So if I restart, now that I've flushed the cache and it's going to go and rebuild. Okay, so now down into this. So there it is, hitting it. And if I look at the data, right, it shouldn't have our test data in there. Right, top of the week is zero. Oh, I was just going to get ready to pound my head. Because <laughs> you know how that stuff goes. Oh, gosh, yes. Oh, yes. All right, so there it goes loading. We'll go to the console so we can send that refresh command. And come on. All right, so there it is. No contributors. That was really quick, but it there was no flash. It just updated. I like that a lot better than what we've got right now. You know, nice. we could put a we could put a CSS animation on that or something, but that feels a heck of a lot better than what we were doing before. No, you want to go back to the old marquee tag. Mm. Don't do that to me. <laughs> hey, Parathon, thank you so much for the subscription. Three months in a row with us. 
that's great. And Bill and Steve are dancing. All right. Is there anything else that we should cover with SignalR now that we're done fumbling through updating and making this update a little bit better, a little bit cleaner than just completely repaving the entire thing? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I suppose we could talk about message pack really quick. Oh, good idea. All right, so what's message pack? Since that might help at some point. I mean, you don't have a whole lot of data, but it never hurts to be, um, what's the word, frugal, I guess, with your with bits and bytes. You know, I know we have a lot of RAM nowadays and good bandwidth generally, but still, uh, mobile devices are out there, and they don't. They don't necessarily have really. They good don't bandwidth. necessarily have the best bandwidth or memory. So what Message Pack is is it's a message serialization formatter. So it works with like JSON and binary data and stuff like that. And it's a you could just go to msgpack.org Message Pack or just you know go to your favorite search engine and type in Message Pack. Uh, and the, its site will come up first. It's like JSON, but fast and small. Yeah, like JSON, but fast and small, right? Which is kind of funny because remember when JSON was going, it's like XML, but fast and small. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the same kind of thing. Just being able to take JSON data and squishing it up uh, right there, that nice little picture that it has, JSON with 27 bytes, and they could pack it down to 18 so it just strips out any of the extra gunk that you might have. By gunk, I just mean unnecessary storage room. But isn't or this... that JSON would have because it is text based? But didn't we have something like this with protocol buffers? Yeah, but this is a little bit different in that all you do is when you open a connection and you do the hub connection and you do the with URL and the dot build. You just squeeze and add message pack protocol in there, and that's all you have to do. Are you kidding? I'm not kidding. That's like and, literally. And we save bytes. Yes. So actually, there should be a docs, a new docs doc up on message pack in the last that went up in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so if you go to the SignalR site on docs again, so I, I'm just going to search for message pack. Use message pack hub protocol in SignalR, and look at that. It was updated. What is that? Yesterday. Quite possibly. By yeah, Brennan it's a pretty new. Yep, Brennan wrote that. So he's okay. on the SignalR team. So add message pack protocol. Yep, that's it. And then on the client, add message pack protocol. And it'll send yeah. smaller bits of data. Yep, so that's all you do. I mean, look at the document's kind of small. So you just do your add message pack protocol with your oh. add SignalR. I almost forgot about that one. And a little bit of code. We need and to then bring on the in... client, just say that you need to add it, and then you're good, and you've got it packed. It looks like there's an extra library we need to bring in for message pack. But right. Yeah. That's not a big deal. So if I run over to my startup, and my startup has, well, it's not, it's going to be hiding over here. I took, because I configure so many services, I put them out into a separate class. Right. Um, so I'm going to look for... Where is it? All my ASP.NET stuff I put in one place. So add MVC okay. there, add SignalR, add JSON protocol. So you're telling me I could do instead of add JSON, I could say add message pack protocol. Now, do I need to bring in something for yeah. that? Uh, no, you should be good. Uh, you need that little client library, though. Well, it looks like I need a NuGet package. Right. So let's grab this one. Um, I'm an elite developer, so I edit my project files directly. Fancy pants you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> there we go. And then I can say version 2.10. Actually, half the time that's like faster than using the package manager. <laughs> It's really it. Yeah. Shenanigans of SignalR contributors. Yes. Yeah. All right. So if I control dot on this, do I get... I don't get a... It can't find it. I don't know what the version is on that. Restoring packages. Build failed. What are my errors? SignalR message pack. Unable to find package. SignalR message... Uh, protocols message pack with version greater than 210. Yeah, I think the message pack version is different. 
Is it? You could do uh, an install package at the command line. <sighs> but I was yeah. editing my, C sh my, my project file and it felt so good. Or just take the version out. Let it find the latest. Let it find the latest. Okay. Saved. Restoring packages. Installing. It was 1.0. Did you see that? Mm. There we go. Ugh. So does this work now? Nope. It, it's not showing it. Is it going to build and like that? Nope, build failed. Add message pack, pack protocol accepts a first argument of I signal our server builder. What? So add signal R, add message pack protocol. Hmm. But it's not liking. I think it's that you need to put the version in there or something. Get it like on a with the package manager for some reason. Hmm. All right. Let's do the install package. Let's try and see how that works. Manage NuGet packages. Blah, 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 blah. Message pack. Right, see if it finds that. Oh, dear Lord, no. I'll give it the entire name. 101. Good, install it. Package restore failed. Version conflict in connections abstractions. Oh boy. Project dependency does not contain an inclusive lower bound. Include a lower bound. Oh no. If I grab the 100. Okay, that looks like it installed properly. There it is declaring the 100. Oh, that that time it found it. Yeah, I wonder if the that 101 version just didn't work. Hey, build succeeded. All right. Now the other thing it said was a an npm package. Yeah, uh, yeah. All right, so I'll go into npm over here and what's the name of that package? Something message back. There, ASP.NET, SignalR protocol, message pack. Um, it's a dependency, so I need it in this one. Uh, it looks like it worked. And with a little bit of luck. Now, that's going to bring it down and put it in my node modules. I need to copy it over into my project so that it's over here in the signal R. Right? Yeah. Yep. So what I have in bundle config to do that for the signal R bits is right here. Um, and you know what? I could m minify those together, which feels like the right thing to do, you know? But it does. But only slightly dangerous. So it's in this location. Uh, wait a sec. The module can be used directly via JavaScript module loader or imported into the imported into the browser by referencing the node modules. Blah 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 blah. In a browser, the message pack five library must also be referenced. So we need to bring in that as well. All right, so I'm going to grab that location, and I'm going to concatenate all these things together. Okay. So in the meantime, Visual Studio started popping up a bunch of errors after you hit the debugger last time, and it's forcing me to end task it. Because it won't respond to any of my clicks. 
Oh, man. On a modal dialogue, yeah. Okay. Hey, look, you disconnected from the collaboration session. Yeah. You should be able to use the same um, session identifier to get connected. Not getting the version for the package manager section in the configuration. Yeah, it, it got the wrong version. So I need this location. And let's turn these into forward slashes. So by using the bundler con minifier, I'm actually going to grab all of that code that I want as one signal R client, concatenate it together, and uh, hopefully I don't need to add extra references because I'm just adding new capabilities to signal R. Right. So the yeah, you shouldn't really have to do anything uh, once you get it configured. Yeah. All right. So uh, lib. So I have signal R in my signal R client now. No, don't reformat it. Right, so now I've got the SignalR JavaScript client, but here's all the message pack stuff. ES6 promises, that client. Where'd it go? The message pack stuff should be in here. It'll be in here. It's in there. I'm hoping. Um, all right. So the last piece to enable it after adding those is with hub protocol over here like that. So we wrote our stream hub here and when it does the connection with URL with hub protocol. And hopefully that'll work. So we'll give it a shot. Yep, so you have to add in your script tags, and then, yep, you're with Hub Protocol. And I'm skipping the script tags because I've got... Because you have it bundled. Yeah. All right, so... So this follower count, I thought I just saw it update, and you'll see it over here as well, the viewer count. Yep, there it went. So the, the viewer count on this T... All right, catch you later, Mr. Magoo. Is actually, it's a... It's a test uh, version of a stream provider like Twitch that just counts every couple seconds. Ah, okay. Uh, there it goes. It just updated by itself. So we're using now the, uh, the message pack to squeeze that down, make it smaller to push over the network. That was too easy, and I... I really like using the bundler minifier so I don't have to go and update everything everywhere. Right, right. You don't need to put those tags all over the place and everything. You do it in one place. Yeah, right? I, because I'm abstractly referencing that SignalR client out there, and it's just loading it. So that was pretty cool. Yep. All right. Well, I think we accomplished, nice. a, I think we accomplished a little bit here today. Um, and before we wrap up, Let's uh let's stop this. Commit the changes. Um, I'm gonna play our Super Mario music because we're wrapping up. Uh, see, isn't that isn't that? <laughs> Hurry super up! Super fast speed. Finish, Jeff. So uh, let's just verify what we changed, including GitHub make GitHub face. Um. All right, so I am going to git commit am um, simplified simplified reloading uh, just the repository that changed in the uh, in the GitHub ticker, and then I'll push that up, and we're done. Uh, oh, and right. now the commits will have updated, and then it will reload on your ticker. And then it will reload on this tick. Well, actually, it won't because I tell it to ignore me. Oh. I know. Right? Thanks for the... Yeah. You like the wrap-up music, Claire? I think it works. Um, cool. All right. So we learned a little bit more about SignalR today. We learned about Message Pack and how to use that and how easy it was to drop that in and, and ship less data down even though I want to push more rich data down so that I can get uh, I can get a more real-time nicer response and update on that on that user interface 
um, that message pack is going to make that data even smaller. That's great. Yep. Um, thanks so much for helping here today, Rachel. This was fun. Sure. We'll uh, we'll have to figure out a, a, some more shenanigans, some more to work on here together. Yeah, that's in the true. future. More shenanigans. Yes. Um, all right, I'm going to go back to the funky music and uh, remind folks. We'll we'll archive off this video. It'll be over on the YouTube channel a little bit later today. Um, I hope you join me tomorrow. You tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday, so we'll have F Sharp Friday, and we're going to work on hooking up a uh, a web hooking up an Azure function to listen to that webhook that fires from GitHub and start loading that data into a database up there. And then all of the stuff that we built here today will just load from that database instead of from GitHub. All righty, catch you later, Rachel. All we'll right, see, see you, Jeff. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Take care.